Welcome to Common Sense Institute's Common Sense Digest podcast. My name is Alexa Eastberg, and I am a research analyst with Common Sense Institute. As an analyst, I am proud to help provide fiscal analysis on proposed policy changes facing Colorado. Policy changes can often have broad and long-term ripple effects. We utilize dynamic economic models and other tools to simulate economic impact scenarios across Colorado's economy. I hope you enjoy this episode as we dig into the data. And now, here's your host, Earl Wright. Welcome to Common Sense Digest podcast. My name is Earl Wright, and I am the chairman of the board of Common Sense Institute. Thank you for joining us today. The state of Colorado is facing a housing affordability crisis, inflation, dealing with soaring crime rates and homelessness, as well as many other issues. The list of challenges Coloradans are facing is daunting. But across our great state, local leaders are digging in, and we have two of those with us today. They're rising to the challenge, coming up with innovative ways to create opportunity for their residents. Joining this conversation are John Southers, the mayor of Colorado Springs, and Dustin Zavani, councilman of Aurora. Mayor Southers has a wealth of knowledge and experience in government management. In 1988, he served as a district attorney for the 4th Judicial District, which includes El Paso and Teller Counties. From 2005 to 2015, he served as the Attorney General of Colorado, where he received the Kelly Wyman Award. Mayor Southers was re-elected to a second term as Mayor of Colorado Springs in April of 2019 after a successful first term where he led ballot measures focused on infrastructure improvements, re-establishing the city's stormwater system. Welcome, Mayor Southers. Thank you, Earl. Glad to be with you. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Councilman Zazvonik is the president and founder of Zavonic Consulting, as well as a partner and senior advisor at Rising Cloud. He has over a decade of experience in public policy roles. He managed the Aurora-based district office for a member of Congress, and as the policy director of the Colorado State Senate Minority Leader, and CSI was fortunate enough to have Dustin serve as our director of policy for a short period. Far too short, I might add, Dustin, but it worked well for us. In November of 2021, Dustin was elected as a councilman of Aurora. He is currently the chairman of the Public Safety Committee and the vice chairman of Planning and Economic Development Committee. Councilman Zavani is also a chairman of the Red Tape Reduction Committee and is a member of the Management and Finance Committee. Welcome, Councilman Zavani. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. It's good to have you back with us. Yeah. Before we begin... If you'd like uh, more background discussion of the topics we're going to cover today, I'd encourage you to go on uh, CSI's website, www.commonsenseinstituteco.org. Uh, we have some very good studies that have been put together by fellows that we have uh, in crime and also affordable housing, as well as the homelessness issue, which we'll cover today, and the reports that we encourage you to read in addition to this podcast. Well, let's get started. Mayor Southers, as the 41st mayor of Colorado Springs, it is your responsibility to make decisions that benefit your community and the overall economy at Colorado Springs. Housing and homelessness play a large role in your commitment to making your community better. What are a few projects you you have led to overcome the housing crisis in your community? Well, Earl, a big part of the housing crisis in our community is simply a supply and demand issue. Uh, Colorado Springs is a rapidly growing uh, community. Uh, we're one of the most desirable cities in America or in everybody's top 10 list these days. Uh, a lot of uh, young people moving here to take high paying jobs and cybersecurity and things like that. And we simply do not have enough housing to accommodate them. Uh, so the one thing we need to do is facilitate, uh, you know, government doesn't create the housing, but government uh, in many ways stands back, gets out of the way, doesn't overregulate, and allows uh, that housing to take place. And we've, uh, uh, we've been very intentional about that. A lot of new housing is being constructed. Uh, we're still uh, short. Uh, th- that supply and demand is resulting in higher prices. Of course, there's other factors there too, supply chains and all that sort of thing. Uh, but what we're steering away from is any kind of moratoriums or anything that would exacerbate the problem. And I think uh, we're, we're starting to make some progress. You know, we're starting to see a little more inventory. Uh, and hopefully, uh, as uh, kind of this boom 
moderates a little bit, uh, the housing, uh, the supp- supply and demand situation will cause uh, uh, our housing crisis to abate a little bit as well. Throughout the United States and some of the studies we've done uh, here in Colorado suggests that the real housing shortage that is, is, is incredibly painful at the present time is the middle, middle income and lower. Uh, how are you handling that or how do you see that particular issue being resolved for Colorado Springs? You know, I, I think that's very uh, astute. The fact of the matter is it's in the 400,000 to 600,000 range. The houses are going off the market really quickly. Lower than that, they're going very, very quickly. You know, we want to make sure that uh, we incentivize, and I say incentivize, you know, get out of the way of, of businesses that are trying to get into that niche and create housing for those those groups. Now, in the affordable housing, you know, for those that can't afford market rate housing, uh, we've been very active. Uh, the uh, uh, Colorado Housing Authority, CHAFA, will tell you that Colorado Springs has produced percentage-wise uh, a greater increase in uh, uh, tax credit financing housing than anybody else. In just six years, we've gone from 3,000 tax credit financed units to 6,100. We've more than doubled. I made it a, a goal in my 2016 State of the City address to go from 500 facilitated affordable housing units a year to uh, 1,000. We've now reached it and uh, have a goal of 1,500 a year uh, going uh, going forward. Uh, so we think we've made a lot of progress, but uh, it's not a problem that's going to be solved overnight. Okay. Well, let's you know, talking about affordable housing. Let's maybe focus on the homeless issue in Colorado Springs if we could. You know, you, 2019 point in time count had 1,500 people were experiencing homelessness in Colorado Springs. What's your office and what's the city of Colorado Springs doing uh to decrease the number of experiencing homelessness, and how do you view that issue for Colorado Springs? Yeah, great question. Uh, first of all, we have to talk about uh, who constitutes the homeless. We have two groups of uh, homeless, situational homeless, uh, people who very much want to be housed, uh, but because of domestic violence, uh, uh, job loss issues, things like that, are unable to be housed. I think we do a really good job of meeting the needs of that group. You know, we've got uh, ho- hotel motel vouchers that we can temporarily house people. We really have several nonprofit organizations that work very effectively with that group that wants to be housed and is only uh, situationally homeless. Then you've got the chronically homeless, and there you've got a group that want to be housed and a group that don't want to be housed. For those that want to be housed, uh, we have worked very hard to meet the, uh, a, a very important requirement of having enough shelter beds for everybody who wants to be sheltered. And I'll explain why that's so legally uh, significant in a moment. So we've developed 750 shelter beds, primarily the Colorado Springs Rescue Mission and the Salvation Army. That is more than we have uh, unsheltered people. In fact, uh, we've made tremendous progress. We've uh, reduced our unsheltered count. Uh, from about uh, 540 in uh, 2016 to the 2022 count of uh, five uh, of 270, so we've uh, uh, reduced it in half. We're one of very few large cities that had a significant reduction in the unsheltered. So what do we do? Uh, those that want to be sheltered, we move them into our shelter beds. We offer them drug treatment. We offer them uh, health care. We have a clinic right across the street. Uh, behavioral health care, uh, drug treatment, as I say, if they uh, want to work at, uh, at it, we can move them into transitional housing. We even have a transitional housing uh, complex on the rescue mission uh, campus. And we are now are building other transitional housing. But then, Earl, we have that small segment right now, 270 that don't want to be housed. And we have taken what I would call a tough love approach. Okay. Uh, we have camping bans, we have don't sit, don't lie bans, and we are going to aggressively enforce them. And we're able to enforce them because we can offer them a shelter bed. So the police hand them a document. Uh, this is where you can find shelter. If you uh, remain uh, camping illegally, we're going to clean up this camp in 24 hours. Uh, we cleaned up 1,400 camps uh, in 2021, about a million and a half pounds 
of uh, uh, trash. But we think it's that aggressive enforcement that has allowed us uh, to uh, reduce our unsheltered count. I'm going to get myself in trouble, Mary, here for a second. But if I understand correctly, in Denver, they tried to be a, a little bit assertive with regards or more assertive, similar to what you're doing with regards to the uh, uh, folks that wouldn't go into uh, prearranged housing as well as maybe camps. And uh, they got they got a court order that said uh, you could not do it. How is it you're you've avoided such a court order with regards to uh, how you're you're handling your homeless issue? By being able to show we have enough shelter beds and we offer everybody that we enforce against a shelter bed, and they say no, and then we uh, are able to enforce, and we've survived all legal challenges thus far. If you know how to do it, I guess you can solve the issue, or at least begin to solve the issue, and you process. All right. Dustin, uh, you've uh, recently got uh, headline news in Aurora uh, implementing a camping ban that prohibits camping on public property in Aurora. Why now are you doing it? And how do you see this ban uh, succeeding in light of what you just heard from the mayor? Have you got the proper processes in place so the courts can't shut you down? Yeah, absolutely. And so to, to your first question as to why, Aurora has an incredible amount of potential. When you think about the Anschutz Medical Campus, Buckley Space Force Base, and an enormous amount of undeveloped land around the third busiest airport in the world, uh, which, by the way, would be a great place to move the new Denver Broncos Stadium when the Walton family takes them over and they're looking for a home. I have a spot for them. But with all of that potential, we also have to be a city that is safe. And there is just no question that these uh, homeless encampments that are on the sides of our highways just beyond fence lines of backyards in our neighborhoods and next to our small businesses, they were creating significant public health and safety challenges for our community, which is why we decided to enforce this ban. And and much like the mayor said, we recognize, one, we have to ensure that we have um, adequate shelter beds in place to offer them a place to go. Our other concern, and, and this is why I believe the shelter option is so important, our concern is that many of the people who are choosing to go into the encampments are in that second bucket that Mayor Southers described. And these are people who are disassociating from society. They're disassociating from services. And so our hope is that by saying, hey, listen, you can't be on the sides of our roads. You can't be in these encampments. Hopefully, a number of them will choose to go in for the first time, go into a shelter system and get, whether it's mental health support, addiction support, job service training, whatever it is that they need to try to get um, back on their feet. We are looking at the Colorado Springs Rescue Mission model because it's, and frankly, it's a good one. And I think that, um, you know, we want to replicate a lot of the the good work that the mayor in in Colorado Springs is doing here because our next door neighbor to the west, Denver, they're doing a poor job at it. And I want Aurora to be the big sister in the sister city relationship with Denver. And I believe we have the assets to make that happen, but we have to be safe. And that's why as soon as our council kind of switched hands last, last fall, they're nonpartisan, but had a more center-right, free market tilt to it, we were aggressive in trying to address our public safety challenges because we know they're so foundational to our ability to reach the potential that we have as a city. The uh, Common Sense Institute uh, put together its initial study uh, with regards to the cost of homelessness, uh, particularly in the Denver range area. It was 42, they said approximately 42 to 104 million per homeless Person, how much is this program costing the taxpayers of Colorado Springs, and how much is it costing the taxpayers of Aurora to do what you have put in place and plan to put in place? I'll start in Colorado Springs. It's quite remarkable, Earl. I can't say everybody can replicate the nonprofit community we have, but we have a very large one, and they're doing tremendous work. Uh, the city, in order to achieve the goal of having enough shelter beds to enforce our camping ban, uh, we did agree to put $500,000 a year into the rescue mission and the uh, Salvation Army. Other than that, the only money that we put in is pass-through federal money, community block grants and things like that that are meant for this particular uh, uh, sorts of program. So the burden on the taxpayer is is really minimal. To, to give an example, uh, Peak Vista, which is our largest indigent uh, uh, health care network, they're the ones that built the clinic across the street from the rescue mission that provides full-service health care, uh, in, including behavioral health care. And, of course, 
uh, they have to bring these folks, when these folks come in, they have to get them registered for uh, Medicaid. So I, there's obviously a taxpayer burden there because the federal taxpayer is paying that. But in terms of, uh, uh, really, it's it's a surprisingly small burden on the general fund of the city of Colorado Springs. I have a follow-up to that, but Dustin, please, would you fill us in? Yeah, no, I, and and, and uh, you know, to the mayor's point about how little Colorado Springs we're actually on the opposite end of that spectrum. We, we spend more than that on our, out of our general fund for homeless, but it's because we don't have the same type of, of nonprofit partners. And this is something that as we've instituted our camping ban and started to look at how we're going to address homelessness from a municipal standpoint, because we often get compared to Denver, and I'm sure that, that the mayor would agree, but we're not a county. We don't have a health and human services department. We have, and our, and our tax revenue is really sales tax dependent. And so what I want to see and what we are working toward building out is a comprehensive strategy that includes the emergency shelter and the transitional housing necessary. Um, and then and then partnering with the right nonprofits, because I think one of the challenges we've had in Aurora and the thing that I've learned in my first six, seven months on council is that there are a lot of nonprofits out there that are measuring success by the number of beds they provide and the number of meals they serve, but not by the number of people that they're helping to change their conditions. And they're getting lots of money from the city and from other people. We have to change the nonprofit partnerships that we have in the city of Aurora to look more like what Colorado Springs has, I believe, and we'll end up spending less taxpayer dollars and have a better outcome. So if, if uh, Colorado Springs were at uh, a 10 on your scale, you're saying, hey, we aspire to be a 10 on the scale of success, but we're just in the process of putting that plan together and we have some basic principles we're going to operate by. Is that fair to say, Dustin? That's fair to say. Okay. Dustin, I'm not going to let you off the hook on the homeless issue here. I want to kind of look at the state, uh, across the, the homeless issue across the state. And I'd like the, you and the mayor to possibly answer this question. What do you all see as the largest barrier to helping those who are experiencing homelessness in the broader state of Colorado? And how do we overcome it? Dustin, I, take a crack at it. And then, mayor, if you would afterwards. Yeah, I, for me, the, the, my my personal opinion is I look at the homeless challenge and the spike in it. It's addiction. I think um, the rise of, of use in synthetic opioids, including fentanyl, has created. And this is the visual homelessness, right? These are the people who are in the encampments that we're seeing because, again, these are people who are trying to disassociate from society and their services. And, and many of them, by the way, present as having significant mental health issues because of what these synthetic opioids have done to their minds. So I think addiction is probably the number one um, challenge that we have in terms of what's driving more homelessness. Earl, this is a long, uh, kind of sad story. We, uh, just to give you an example, 1965, for old as fo uh, folks as old as you and I, Earl, that doesn't seem so long ago, there were, uh, you know, 600,000 Americans in state mental health hospitals. Mm -hmm. uh, we closed the vast, vast majority of them with the best of intentions. We wanted them to go on psychotropic medications that worked, what we did not calculate is that the vast majority, a lot of these people, would not uh, have the support group that would get them on these medi medications. And folks that used to be in our state hospitals would be sleeping under bridges and all that sort of thing. And we have simply not done a good job nationally and particularly in Colorado in terms of our, our mental health uh, funding. Secondly, I, I agree with uh, uh, Dustin. We have, in my opinion... Uh, a schizophrenic drug policy in, in Colorado. You know, we, we basically are turning the other way to the fact that uh, more than 20% of our young people under age are smoking marijuana. This is high, high potency stuff. Uh, a lot of them are getting addicted to it, and we're shocked, shocked, shocked when at the age of 19 and 20 they're di dying of uh, uh, fentanyl uh, overdoses. As I say, I think we've uh, very much failed in our drug uh uh, policies. Uh, so those are some of the barriers. I got to tell you, as a lawyer, I think the uh, ACLU uh, has been a huge barrier. Uh, you got to uh, deal with them all the time. They're always looking over your shoulder. And I believe in the rule of law when the court tells me that I got to have enough shelter beds before I can go out and enforce a camping ban, I do it. But having to comply with uh, a lot of these uh, 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 court orders uh, is pretty burdensome in trying to deal with a, a situation that and, and, you know, people call me all the time, say, hey, John, uh, somebody's putting up a camp uh, down on such and such a street. 
uh, go get him right now. And I said, well, I'll send a cop down there. He's going to give him 24-hour notice. And if he's still there in 24 hours, we're going to clean him up. And I got to explain, you know, what kind of court orders uh, there are that make us do that. So uh, I would say there's a variety of factors that uh, make this a difficult problem for us. Let's move into another topic, just because uh, it seems to me that with the homelessness, uh, concurrently, at least some of the studies we've done at CSI, with the increase in homelessness, we've also an increase in crime. I'm not saying they're related. I'm just saying we've concurrently had those two things happen. Dustin, uh, policymakers and the community are noting uh, as a key issue of the state is crime and the raise of crime. And you, I think you probably have both read the Brockler and Morrissey uh, common sense uh, crime studies, of which two have been produced so far. Um, give me a sense, if you would, of what's the crime like in Aurora and how is it affecting your community? But I also, for the podcast, uh, you've got a very different community than Colorado Springs. Uh, in that uh, I heard one time you guys have like 60 different languages that are spoken in Aurora. I, I'm sure there's several different languages in Colorado Springs, but the ethnicity of your particular community is really quite extraordinary. So talk to us about the crime and uh, how it might be unique to what's going on and what you're doing. Now, Aurora is um, the most diverse city in the state. It's one of the most diverse cities in the country, and I mean that in every sense of the word, from the north to the south part of the city, it's it's just, it's much different. Crime is impacting um, Colorado, and we're number one in a whole host of things. In Aurora, it's a significant issue. As I, I'm an at-large member of council, so I, I have an opportunity to visit with people in every corner of our city, and when I talk to them, the thing that I hear about the most is crime. It's motor vehicle theft, it's shootings, it's youth violence, Retail theft and property theft, and that's really where the homeless encampments um, creates issues is when they're right next to these small businesses. You're seeing more property crimes. So crime is a, a significant issue, which is why, you know, I, I want to focus long term on helping Aurora reach its economic potential because I think it's good for our city, our city and I think it's good for the state. But in the short term, since I've been on council, it's really been focusing on what are the things that we can do to address crime, helping to rebuild our police department. Um, I brought forward a ordinance recently to make our municipal code more punitive for motor vehicle theft. Colorado saw an 89 percent spike in motor vehicle theft from 2019 to 2021, which put us in the top spot nationally per capita. That in that same period of time, Aurora has gone up 239 percent. And and the thing is, people aren't stealing cars to go for joy rides. They're stealing cars to commit other crimes. And so it's a, it's a major issue for us, Earl, and it's it's something that um, myself and my colleagues have been really laser focused on. I was grateful for the opportunity to chair the public safety committee, where I can really focus on ways to make our community safer. Because as I said, it's so foundational to so many of the other things we want to accomplish. Dustin, yeah, I think you're kind of under understating the the uniqueness of what you're talking about. You, as a community, have decided that you're going to enforce. If you find somebody in your community, you're going to enforce something that the the local uh, authorities uh, have not been enforcing in the judicial system, and the police have not been able to take these folks, you know, off the streets if they steal a car. Uh, as Mitch Morrissey and George Brockler said in the podcast we've had, you know, these folks are right back on the street, and they in effect have a ticket, and they're out stealing a car, oftentimes stealing a car the next day, and they could have done. In this several times. So what you're proposing is you would actually take them off the street and you can do that at a local level, regardless of what's going on at the county and the state. Yeah, at a certain level, um, right? Because it, it, once it gets to the, the value of the card reaches a certain level, it becomes a felony charge, which will then go to the district attorneys. But yeah, we are, the ordinance that I'm running for, it has minimum mandatories for habitual offenders, um, for people who fail to appear. It increases the penalty for a theft of essential parts like catalytic converters, another um, challenge we've seen. You, you've seen, um, it was in your report that, that uh, Brockler and Morrissey put out. Over the course of the past six or seven years, as the state has lowered penalties, as they've made crime more permissive, we've seen more crime. Um, and as a local elected official, my focus has been to do everything we can by using municipal code to make our city as safe as possible, recognizing we really need a statewide solution. Because what will happen is if my ordinance and Aurora Police Department is going to be putting together a specialty unit focused on motor vehicle theft, if we're successful, good news for Aurora, it's very bad news for Denver because that people are going to still steal cars. So we need a statewide solution. But in absence of statewide leadership, 
it's going to fall on local local officials um, to step up and, and make more punitive um, laws in our municipal code in order to fight back against the crime spikes that we've seen. Well, let's hope you're successful. Mayor Southers, how is the Colorado Springs, uh, your community, and how, what would be done to decrease crime in the state and make Coloradoans feel safe in their communities from your perspective? Well, I've got a pretty long-term perspective. I've been a district attorney. I ran the Colorado Department of Corrections. Uh, I was the United States Attorney. Earl, we should not let uh, the state legislature on, uh, off the hook on this. In my opinion, our significant crime problems in Colorado are directly related to an imbalance of uh, power and philosophy in the Colorado legislature. Uh, over the last several years, uh, our legislature has reduced sentences. It's uh, provided for early release from prison. It's made it harder to revoke parole uh, and easier to be uh, released on bond. And as the report that you referenced uh, indicated, in the same uh, period where our prison population has been reduced very intentionally, I mean, the legislature has been hell-bent on reducing our prison population. They've done so by 23% with a corresponding 42% increase in crime, that's a bad, bad combination. We have way too many criminals on the street, and the only thing that's going to solve that, you know, we can do our things locally, and we can uh, make sure we have enough police officers. That's a tough job right now. We have uh, the right kind of prosecutors, but we have got to restore some philosophical balance in the Colorado legislature because right now they are way too left-leaning, and it's uh, being reflected in our criminal justice policies. Well, as, as you both know, we're not R or D. We're just kind of bland, do research, and try to figure out based upon the research, and then we give that information to either R or Ds. But one of the things that, boy, you cannot hide from is the deadly opioid situation we have in the state right now, Dustin. And uh, we found that over 800 fentanyl-related deaths were in the state of 2021 in our state. Uh, what are your your uh, thoughts on the fentanyl crisis? And I know, uh, Mary, you've also written an op-ed piece with the, the uh, mayor of, of uh, Denver, Michael Hancock. But I'm going to let Dustin kind of respond first, and I'd like your comments. I, I looked at the fentanyl crisis, and it is a crisis that we face in our state, was, again, it was created by these permissive offender-friendly laws that were passed by the General Assembly when they allowed, they, they treated it like a misdemeanor, and, and in fact, and I'm going to let Mayor Southers talk about it because he mentioned it in his op-ed. This past session, they went back to fix it. They didn't fix it. Possession should be a felony of this. This is a very deadly drug that is impacting our community, and and it's killing you know young and old. And it's it, I believe that it's another. We talked about the addiction challenges with homelessness. It's causing so many other challenges beyond addiction. So it is a crisis. And again, I think we're number two in the country. This is another area where Colorado, you know. We like to, to run with the, the herd on economic issues and lead the pack on these criminal issues, which is not a good place for us to be as a state. Dustin mentioned the uh, legislative session, which uh, was suggested by a lot that we didn't really come up with the answer. We, well, many people had hoped anyone. I don't need to pass an opinion. But what is your, your sense of the legislation that was passed? And what do you think is a better solution if there is one, Mayor? Well, I think the bill had some good things in terms of uh, – you know, healthcare approach to it. Uh, this has to be a supply and demand uh, battle. But uh, I was very disappointed in the law enforcement approach. Uh, just to give you an idea, more people died of uh, fentanyl overdoses in the United States in 2021 alone than in Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan combined. I mean, that's pretty incredible. This is very, very deadly stuff. In In light of that, or in spite of that, what the Colorado legislature did is create a mental state that you have to prove that you knew you were dealing uh, fentanyl that doesn't exist for any other drug. Why should we have a higher burden of proof uh, for fentanyl than we have for cocaine or meth methamphetamine? And then we created a Good Samaritan provision that we don't have in any other drug that says if you distribute it and the person dies of an overdose and you call the police and cooperate, you, you'll avoid uh, criminal accountability. It just doesn't make any sense. This is a, a weapon of mass destruction, quite frankly. Very small amounts can kill a lot of people, and we have got to be serious about it. And I just did not think the legislature was as serious as they needed to be. But for those that may not have heard the podcast, the most recent one with uh, 
George Proctor and, and uh, Mitch Morrissey, uh, they give an example of what the law used to be. And it was interesting that uh, oftentimes if you came in and got charged with a felony on possession, uh, for example, right now, they would give you a chance to have that dropped to a misdemeanor or wiped off if you just went into uh, rehab and you were successful in rehab. And one of the examples they give, which blew me away, guys, was that one of our current uh, uh, judges, a very highly regarded judge, went through that process. He was a he was a drug addict, and they were he had a felony being faced, and he said, "Guess what? I'm going to get off of it." And he got himself cleaned up, and now he's out there serving the community in a way which I wouldn't expect. But it seems to me we have a ways to go there, and I don't think people are going to give up on it. I, and I understand what you're saying. We need a little bit more balance in the legislature. I want to go on to the affordable housing in Colorado a little bit more, if I could. Dustin, uh, you with that diverse, diverse community you have. It seems to me that uh, housing is a huge, huge issue. You have a, a large number of first-generation people in Aurora. How do you see Aurora and what you're facing, as well as affordability challenges for the state and how they might be handled? Yeah, 20% of our uh, population is foreign-born. So it's a, as we go back, very diverse community. And, and the cost of living is impacting everybody right across the state, across the country. Um, everything when you go from the, the grocery store to fill up your gas, um, it, it, everything is more expensive. Housing is more expensive. And one of the things that from a housing standpoint, and this goes back to what Mayor Souther said at the beginning, part of it is an old fashioned supply and demand. There's just not enough homes on the market, which is driving up the cost. The other thing that we've tried to tackle from a local government perspective is the, the increase in costs that results from process and regulatory burdens in home um, in building homes. There was a HBA study, a Home Builder Association study recently that had that 25 percent or said that 25 percent of the cost of a single family home comes from uh, regulations. Right after being elected, um, I created the Red Tape Reduction Committee. And the idea of the committee was to look at rules and regulations, taxes and fees and city processes and ask developers, builders, small businesses, whether you're retailers, anybody who operates in the city, and ask them, what are those rules and regulations, taxes, fees, or city processes that you comply with in Aurora that you might not in others or that are just more punitive so that we could start to roll them back? Oh, in the course of our three months of hearings that we did, we have now have over two dozen changes that we're going to be rolling out. Part of it is just trying to help streamline the processes to get people from the idea of, you know, from a blank piece of land to getting everything that they need underground and start getting up so that we can have more homes available for our residents. We also, from a low ha- or from a low income or affordable housing standpoint, we have our own housing authority, the Aurora Housing Authority, which uh, does good work in the city, supplements some of their budget, but a lot of it is a uh, federal pass-through. But I, from a local government standpoint, the thing that I believe we can do is to help try to create that, that supply to meet the, the overall demand. Uh, Mayor Southers, I'm going to appoint you as the benevolent dictator who is going to have a chance to say, what would I do if I were that benevolent dictator for the state with the affordability issue? What would I like to see done? Uh, I would like to see a couple of things. Number one, uh, we can't have communities uh, uh, pursuing moratoriums. Uh, that's very problematic. I realize, uh, Earl, and for folks that I've lived here a long time. I've lived here my whole life, so I've watched all these growth waves. But it's fascinating to me to watch all these people that got to Colorado last week saying, oh, now let's impose a moratorium. That is not going to help our housing crisis. Uh, second of all, uh, from from affordable housing, uh, below market rate housing, we need uh, to s- facilitate and incentivize through more tax credit financing. Amazingly enough, there's profit uh, organizations willing to get into this a line of business as well as nonprofits. But when we uh, go to every year, we, we send about five or six projects up to the uh, Colorado Housing Authority. And just in terms of the available tax credit program dollars, uh, we'll get uh, uh, maybe two of those approved. So there's things we could do. I think there's going to be a ballot issue this year that I'd encourage people to take a, a close look at. I need to get into some of the uh, find uh, detail to determine whether or not it's good or bad. Uh, but it's it's an issue that we're going to continue to have to work on. And let me tell you, closing the door and saying 
uh, we're not going to build any more housing is not the way to go. I want to thank both of you. Uh, this has been, a, for me, a very enlightening conversation from two people who are rural leaders. Yeah, one, is, I guess, uh, is on the, on the upswing, and the other is, uh, are we saying at the peak of your career, John? Can we say uh, I would say the uh, near the end. I wouldn't say the peak. I got a year to go as uh, Mayor Earl, and it's been a great privilege to be the mayor of my uh, my hometown, which I love so much. But uh, I will be uh, uh, spending more time in the golf course in the not too distant future. Well, I, as I understand, your handicap can use some work. So good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and so, for those who want to learn more about our research on these topics, remember www.commonsenseinstitutecore.organization. Dustin, Mayor Southers, uh, any final words you'd like to say? No, oh, thanks for thanks for having us. Uh, as always, it's great to hear from the mayor, somebody who I can learn a lot from and, and uh, have a lot of admiration for and always enjoy getting to spend some time visiting with you, Earl. My word to your uh, uh, listeners, Earl, is that elections count. Uh, they really do. Uh, don't get the notion that it doesn't matter who votes and how you vote. Pay attention to what's what the issues are, and, and this November could be a critical one in terms of of a lot of the issues that we've been talking about today. Amen, and thank you so much, gentlemen. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Common Sense Digest. For more on today's topic, as well as our research on the most pressing public policy issues facing Colorado, please visit commonsenseinstituteco.org. The preceding episode, along with all others, is available on podcatchers everywhere or on our website under the podcast tab. Our technical producer is John Ekstrom and Deft Communications. This has been a production of the Common Sense Institute.